So I'm really excited about this session, and um, I think a lot of people are excited about, um, about it too. And the reason is because I really believe that design is something we can learn. A lot of people are intimidated by it, and if you're kind of an engineering type, you're kind of not used to um, dealing with visual stuff, and it feels very, like, mushy, you know? It's not, it's not clear, like, what are the rules? And the fact is that um, there are rules uh, for a lot of these design concepts. They're not just arbitrary, they actually can be measured. And so that's one of the things I wanted to convey to you today, is that there are ways of approaching design from a mathematical, rule-based way. And it's a lot like uh, cooking. So if you were at my session yesterday, uh, then you know that I like to use a metaphor when I'm talking about uh, design and giving presentations because I find that it helps us to understand the concepts better. So you could go to a fine restaurant and have a meal prepared by a gourmet cook who has gone to chef school and is a Michelin-starred, you know, uh, restaurant. And, you know, you're, but you're not going to make that at home, right? You don't have that level of training. But that doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile to actually learn how to cook and how to prepare a meal. And when you're first starting, you know, you take out the recipe book and you read the instructions and you do them very carefully and you just go by what you're told until, you know, you get some experience and then you start maybe changing the proportions or adding spices that you like or putting your own spin on it. So that's what I'm uh, hoping that you'll get from this today is the idea that there's some rules that you can follow and these aren't always like 100% hard and fast rules, but they're starting points. So there's a way for uh, you guys to learn some of the concepts by, by starting off, and in the beginning, you'll just be doing it a little bit by rote. Maybe you can download the PDF uh, and actually you know, take some of the rules and try them on your own solutions uh, when you leave here today. A little bit about me, I'm from Toronto, Canada, and uh, yes, there is a country to the north of the US, and that's where I'm from. We're on the north shore of Lake Ontario. And uh, the, uh, the, Toronto is actually really a, a really wonderful city. It started off as a, a sort of a little, it used to be called Muddy York. It was just really kind of in the middle of nowhere. But uh, over the, the course of a couple hundred years, it, it grew up. And in the uh, Victorian era, we were uh, one of the largest uh, distilleries. We had one of the largest distilleries. Uh, so. Uh, like all good metropolises, built on the sales of alcohol. And this is a distillery district now. It's all been um, converted. It used to be all warehouses, cobblestone streets. It was actually the Gooderim and Wirtz, uh, Gooderim and Wirtz um, factory for, for their, and the distillery. So it's a collection of about 20 or so building, buildings with uh, lots of shops, restaurants, theater. It's a fantastic uh, little area. So I just like to plug Toronto a little bit when I have my presentations, because not everybody knows about it. So I'm a musician, I play the cello, and um, I have a degree in performance from the University of Toronto uh, many years ago now. And I volunteer actually with the Mississauga Symphony. We play uh, symphony concerts throughout the year. And this is a really cool event we did this year, which was a Star Wars concert. And as you can see, we had a, a cosplaying team come out and be Star Wars. And I promise you, I actually am in this picture. I'm right there. Oh, thank you. Uh, so these are my kids. I have a tradition of showing embarrassing photos of my children uh, because they don't really like their photo taken. I probably had a better picture, but I just chose this one because I thought, you know, it would be, it would be fun. So uh, they're, uh, they're, my oldest is almost 17 and 14 and my daughter's 11. So uh, it's pretty fun to be, to be their mom. I'm the founder of the blog designingfoundmaker.com. Um, some of you may know it. Uh, please subscribe if, if you don't know it. I specialize in visual um, article, or sorry, articles for visual design uh, for FileMaker developers. And as I mentioned yesterday, and I'll repeat it today, I haven't been publishing a lot because I've been working really hard on a couple of initiatives that I'm just launching uh, here at DevCon. The first is I uh, filmed a web series on visual design, so short one to two minute videos uh, to give you uh, some tidbits about uh, design. And the second is actually a new online school called fmdesignuniversity.com. So the course I have is a design course. It was a, the presentation yesterday was kind of a highlights of the, of the full course, the little bits from the, from the whole course. 
you can get a 20% uh, discount if you're interested in, this, in the course. Uh, there's a code, DevCon 2016. So please sign up. There isn't any content. You can read about the course and the curriculum. I have everything, uh, you know, 80% prepared, but I w had to switch to working on my presentation. So there's still, um, there's still some work to be done. So it'll be coming in the fall. But please uh, stay tuned and uh, at least subscribe so that you'll get notified when it goes live. So one of the things that uh, design is, and there's a number of things that we could define it, it's the process of dividing up the space. And when we divide up the space, there's, we can um, see that there are rules that we can use to actually guide us in how we actually do that. And when we use mathematical rules, it helps us produce a result that we can count on because those rules are going to be applied the same way every time. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to take these rules and then apply them to your own work and maybe even something you can take that you've already designed that already exists and you can, you can revise it. So today we're going to talk about some elements of design. And I just want to call out the little animation because some, if you came to my session last year, you know I had, I was very proud of my little car that traveled along the road. So this is my new animation for this year and I really like how, I'm just going to show it again, how the knife just chops and it's just like suddenly in three pieces. Wait for it. There it is. So elements of design. Uh, next up we'll talk about some basic uh, techniques that you can use in your designs some uh, practical methods that actually in FileMaker that will help you uh, that are math-based. And finally, uh, some presentation methods, uh, some rules that will help you in terms of presenting your actual data. All right, so let's get started. This is really, really simple. I'm just going to talk for a moment about symmetry, probably a concept you all learned in grade three math, but I, I think it's really important. Because um, in design, we do have the element of symmetry. So at its basic a half and a half, you have a whole, right? Everybody understands that. And in, some, in something that's symmetrical, you're just dividing it right down the middle, and you get something that's equal on both sides. And you have balance between both of those sides, right? There's, like Each side is perfectly balanced with the other side. And if something is not symmetrical, does that feel good to everybody? Do you like that off in the corner there? Do you understand why, it's, why I put it there? It doesn't really kind of make any sense. But if I move it to the middle, does everybody go, ah? Oh. Feels better, right? Now, I, this is also symmetry because we have a shape and it's directly in the middle of the screen. But if you look inside the shape, you'll see that the two halves are not actually identical to one another. So this is the element of design uh, that comes in. We have symmetry, but we also have variation within that symmetry. It's not exact symmetry. Because if we look at a lot of exact symmetry, we actually kind of get bored. And we understand it, and then we kind of stop paying attention. So as designers, we want to invoke symmetry, but not be slaves to it, and not be using it, you know, exact, okay, everything has to be symmetrical now. And, it, you, and that's also not how the data works. You're never going to make a layout, probably, that's exactly symmetrical. But we want to make sure that if we do have a group, it's in the middle, that we're not just sort of um, moving things around or, or we're not paying attention to how they're organized. We want overall symmetry for the layout. So I just took, uh, I made a little demo for this session. And I just threw everything up there. And um, I hope you guys see that it is the symmetrical. You can all see that, yes? See some nods? And then I fixed it. And we all feel that that looks a lot better. I hope, I hope we feel that. Uh, for me, for sure, I like the way that everything is grouped together and it feels um, clean and it feels understandable. It feels like the, there was some thought put into the design. So we are drawn to symmetry. We need symmetry. But we can't do too much symmetry because it ends up being uninteresting. And we do want our layouts to have some interest to them. So you're trying to find the balance between symmetry and asymmetry. So next we're going to talk about pattern. Humans are pattern recognition machines. That's just what our brains do. We see patterns everywhere. 
We even see patterns where there are no patterns. You know, the constellations in the sky, like there is no actual, you know, organization to them. But we looked up and we saw that we could connect the dots and make shapes and name them and do all those sorts of things. We are very, very, very good at creating patterns. And patterns are important because they help us learn. So I chose the Fibonacci sequence, a very famous uh, sequence as an example of a pattern to show you. And I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with uh, Fibonacci. He's an old Italian guy who came up with this, uh, with this sequence. And it looks uh, intimidating. And some of the formulas I'll show you today look a little bit intimidating on the screen. But a lot of times, you don't actually need the math. I'm showing it to you so that you know the mathematical basis of it. It doesn't mean you necessarily have to compute you know, it every time. So in this one, all it's saying, essentially, is you take, you take a number, and then you, take, uh, you start with 0, and then you take the next number, which is 1, and you add it to 0, and then you get 1. You add 1 and 1, and you get 2, and so on and so forth. And why is this imp interesting or important? It's because as you go higher and higher and higher in the sequence, the numbers actually start to get closer and closer. The proportion between them gets closer and closer to 1.618. And that's just a fact. That's just an, uh, um, a, a facet of way, the way that the numbers work. And it's really cool. Uh, and we see this actually in nature. So the Fibonacci series appears a lot uh, in the way, say, that um, leaves would grow on a branch in a spiral or a pine cone. The little, um, I don't know what they're called, but the little bits of the pine cone actually form spirals. And this is really a practical application or, or practical reason why this it comes about. And I find it's really fascinating. I don't know if everybody else you know, loves the Fibonacci sequence as much as I do. But if you're interested, there's some really cool videos from Vi Hart about the Fibonacci sequence in nature. Um, and so the, the reason that it's important for us as designers is because we are, on a subconscious level, presented with the Fibonacci sequence all the time. We see it everywhere. There's arguably in the proportions of the human body. So this ratio, 1.618, because it's all around us, we're attuned to it and without even really realizing it. So we tend to really like things that, that kind of conform to that uh, proportion. And I'll talk a little bit about the golden ratio later. Uh, so those, sorry, those, these ferns you can see in the spiral actually forms a Fibonacci spiral. And those are also known as fiddleheads and they're delicious. Just to continue with my food metaphor. So pattern, I just am um, sh showing you an example of pattern and also symmetry and asymmetry, right? So we have a pattern is repeating. We have these five bands of, of color, but they're different. So there's some interest there. So it's not a pattern that's repeated over and over and over and over and over. And we go, OK, we got it. We see the pattern. But there's a little bit of interest within that pattern. So that's important for learning. Because once we see a pattern and when we learn it, then we learn to expect it. So when we see something like a button bar, we say, oh, OK, that's a pattern. We see, we see one, we see two, we see three. That means we can add four, we can add five, and we can add six. And it becomes a pattern. We don't have to reteach you know, what the purpose is of that particular object every time we show it. So we really are going to use pattern to reinforce the learning of the UI uh, for, for the users. Because, because people are so good at it anyway, we might as well use that to our advantage. And when there's repetition, people get to know what that does. And they're like, oh, OK. And they feel a, a sense of trust. They feel a sense of safety. And they think you're a great designer. Because they're like, oh, that person knew exactly you know, where to put that. It was awesome. But if you repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, it's boring. So we need a little bit of variation. So you kind of have to know a little bit when, when enough is enough. But you almost, you know. The too much, it takes a lot to be too much, so don't worry too much about that. For now, use patterns to your advantage in your, de in your designing is my advice. So we talked a bit about the golden ratio. And we talked about phi, 1.618. And uh, has everybody he anybody heard about the golden ratio before? Are people familiar with this? Oh, so quite a few people, so that's good. Awesome. The golden ratio is great. People understand, humans in, as, a, as a species, understand information presented in a rectangle better than in any other shape. It doesn't have to be a golden rectangle, just any rectangle. But you notice we have rectangular screens, television screens. We have rectangular computer screens, iPad screens, iPhone screens. We have um, rectangular books, 
right? Before any computers, we had books in a rectangle. Books are not circular, they're not triangular. We understand that in a block really well. And the golden ratio before, as I said, because we're subconsciously seeing the golden ratio quite a bit in, our, in the natural world, we tend to really like uh, rectangles that are golden ratio, uh, that have sides that conform. So the long side is exactly 1.618 uh, greater than the short side. And a golden rectangle in particular is if you divide one into a square and a rectangle, you can keep dividing it into uh, a squ another square and another rectangle, and so on and so forth. And if you uh, draw a line through the whoops, I'm sorry, through the corners, I messed that up. If you draw a line through the corners of all of those rectangles, you'll see that uh, it forms what's a Fibonacci spiral, right? The same spiral we saw with the ferns. We'll look at it again just because it's cool to watch that line draw itself. So if we take away the, the photo, we see actually a large square and a rectangle. Does anybody recognize this pattern from any applications that they use? Yeah, it's very, very common, right? We have like parent and child or master detail or you know, um, something important and something explanatory. Right? And actually, the demo that I just showed, I did it as a golden rectangle. And it feels good. It feels like they're in the right proportion, right? Like the, the left side is skinny, but not too skinny. You don't feel like the information's crunched. And there's enough space on the right side to actually show what you need to show. I'm not saying you have to use a golden rectangle all the time, but I'm just showing you how you could use it and how uh, it, it makes for a really nice, pro nicely proportioned layout. So the main thing that the golden rectangle does in addition to this nice proportion, is it breaks up what we, you know, what we saw with that direct symmetry, like cutting something directly in half. I've actually done layouts on occasion that are directly in the middle, and they feel kind of strange. I think it works in certain, certain circumstances when we have, like maybe in the import dialog box, where we've got like two like equ absolutely equivalent things, but that's a special case, I think. For a normal layout, it's very un unsettling to have something that is exactly divided in the middle, and you're doing left and right. So when we use um, something where they're, they're slightly different sizes, the uh, golden ratio actually helps us quite a bit. And it's, as we saw, it serves the basis of this common pattern. And it's not the only way. I'll show you rule of thirds later. We could, it's another way of dividing it. So now we'll talk about um, some, some basic techniques. And I just mentioned rule of thirds. I was ahead of myself. The rule of thirds is uh, something we see a lot in photography. And it's just taking the total width of your, let's say, image and dividing it in three. And you can divide it uh, in three, uh, so both horizontally and vertically. So if, I, if you take this image and we I put some measurements on there and we actually divide it up, you can see that the focal points pretty much line up with where the uh, lines cross each other. Almost every uh, camera has actually a, a rule of thirds grid that you can show or hide, right? And it helps you to um, compose your uh, picture a little bit not more nicely. Have you noticed that sometimes if you put something dead in the middle, it's the same thing we were talking about symmetry. When your subject is right in the middle, it feels like meh, but then you just move them off to the side, and you're like, oh, that feels good. And a lot of times the eyes are actually in that uh, focal point, right? one of those focal points. And we really respond to that. We just think that looks better. So how does this apply to software design? Well, it, what it means is uh, that the most important stuff that we're going to show the user should really be in that top and the left part of the layout. And that's because in the Western world, we read left to right and top to bottom. So we want to make sure that when you're designing your layout, you actually use those zones. Does anybody think that we might want to put like um, something really unimportant, like uh, like I don't know, I'm trying to think of a of a like if we put uh, the step one rather than identifying what it was, put step one at the top. It would feel odd because we don't know what we're looking at yet. 
right? So we want to have all that identifying information uh, right at the top. So you can see in this uh, example, we have at the top the identifying of the actual solution, the button bar, the main navigation, and along the side, we have all of the sort of identifying information for what is this solution about. So we can, we can see it at a glance. Yes. Question? I believe so. I have personally not uh, done any designs. The question was, does the, does the opposite apply for uh, languages that read in the opposite direction? And I believe the answer is that, that it does, although I personally don't have any experience. But yes, I think that the, it's all just reversed. We, t we don't tend to, we think that we start right at the very left, but when they do eye tracking studies, they actually see that we don't start at the very, very left most part of the layout. We come in uh, somewhere here. That's what we look at first. And then we kind of move around and read what's in that little, in that quadrant at the top. And then we go across and then we come back. So we go across to number two and then we go down to three and across and then we, we kind of go down. So it's sometimes called a Z pattern. If you were in Jan's uh, session yesterday, he talked a little bit about this, uh, a Z pattern or an F pattern that happens. And they've actually studied this. This is pretty much, um, been proven over and over again by actually tracking people's eyes when they look at images and layouts. So rule of thirds, we're dividing it horizontally and vertically, and we're using that to our advantage to find the natural focal points of where people are going to look first, and we're going to put that important information in that spot. We're going to use it, and we're going to leverage that top, especially that top left focal point. You want to be able to identify what this is about, uh, very quickly, and you can by doing by putting it in the, that area. That's what you'll you'll do. Okay, grids. So there was a whole session on grids uh, yesterday. So I'm not going to go that in depth uh, with grids. I'm just going to give you a bit of a taste. Now this is one where you would use the actual formula. I would in, uh, encourage you to plug the number some numbers in. Uh, it's fairly straightforward, but it's a little tricky because you have margins left and right, but also between columns. So uh, there's not, it's not like you have three columns and three margins. There's extra margins on the sides. So this formula will help you. And I uh, did it with this particular set of numbers. I chose a margin of 20 points. I find that's usually pretty good. Given the sizes of fonts that we typically use, 20 points is a good rule of thumb. You don't have to use 20 points. You can use 25, you can use 15, you can use whatever you want. Um, but, I, but if you don't know what to use, I would say try 20 and see what, see what happens. So if we have three columns, we get each column with is uh, 315. Now I broke this down also. You can see in the blue um, rectangles that very similar to the golden ratio, right? There's a slightly thinner, when you divide it by rule of thirds, there's a, sorry, which is what I actually did by, by saying I wanted three columns. You get a slightly skinnier a left-hand rectangle uh, and then a slightly wider, uh, rec, uh, well, it's not a square anymore. It's a, it's a rectangular area, but the larger area is a little bit wider than you get in the golden ratio, but it's quite close. It's, it's very close. So when you have a grid, when you turn the grid on in FileMaker, this is what you get. I'm talking about something slightly different. There can be sometimes some confusion about designing with a grid and the actual grid feature in FileMaker because they can be, they can support one another, but they're slightly different concepts. So designing with a grid really is about understanding that you're lining things up along the imaginary grid and that you may be combining, as you saw before, I had three columns, but maybe I don't necessarily need to have a layout that is exactly three columns. I'll have one and two, but then on something different, maybe I'll have to have two and one, or I can divide them uh, up in different ways. Jan yesterday talked about a 12 column grid, which gives you lots of variation if you, you, know, you can do three and four, or four and three, or you can do short and long. But the idea is that there's un this underlying invisible structure behind the um, actual design itself that uh, you, you use to leverage. There's also the grid feature in FileMaker, which we can turn on. And what we hope is that those two things support one another. 
Um, but you have to be aware of actually making that happen. So you can actually uh, turn it, if you turn it on, you'll see that you can do a major grid spacing and a minor grid spacing. And I would recommend you do a major grid spacing of 60 points and you have six minor grid steps. What that gives you is each faint line, which I don't think shows up very well here on the monitor, but if you see it in the slides, you'll see it, or if you turn the grid on in FileMaker, that means that each little square is 10 points. And that's really easy mathematically to work with because we're working with round numbers. 60 also happens to be a multiple of 12, right? So you could also do, uh, you, could, you could change it and you use a multiple of 12 if you're more familiar with that, because 12, 24, 36. And also the point sizes tend to be based on 12, and I'll tell you why later. So you can start there, turn the grid on. Now you'll notice, though, because our screen size is not exactly a multiple of 60, it's 1024, there's the, the major lines don't line up quite on the right-hand side, right? So the grid starts off really good on the left, but then because we chose uh, three columns, we have 315, which doesn't divide so evenly, but that's okay. Don't worry, you can use little 20-point, uh, uh, sorry, this one, here is, this one here is 315. I'm just showing you that it's selected and it maybe, no, I'm sorry, I, I got missed, uh, mixed up with my other slide. When you select an object, it will tell you how big it is, and those little blue ones are 20, are 20 points. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But the idea is that you can select objects and use that palette really to help you um, figure out the sizing. So you're going to use the grid to help you create your columns, and you're also going to use the FileMaker grid to help you figure out uh, how to manipulate those objects and whether they're lined up. And what that does is, when you're doing your first layout, you're going to make some decisions about it, and then you're probably going to do your other layouts later, right? And if you use the same grid for everything, that means they're going to coordinate with one another, and they're going to look like they belong together. So it's a really great way to help you build out your design decisions throughout the whole system. And consistency is really, really important uh, because it helps support learning. Ratio and proportion. So this is a little hard because uh, to, to find a, a formula, but I'm going to just uh, use a formula that's a right, essentially a recommendation. So the idea between ratio and proportion is that size differences imply a difference in importance in the information. And when we are designing, we want to establish what we are calling a hierarchy, and which will match the hierarchy of the actual data itself. So the parent objects, generally speaking, you're going to want those to be bigger. Maybe they're not parents, but maybe they're sort of more general. So in, in our case, we had a recipe name. We're going to say that the title text size is going to be two times whatever you use for the field text size. Again, this is not a hard and fast rule. You can play with it, but I would suggest this is a good starting point because it means that your main dish is going to be bigger than the, the rest of the meal. And there's going to be an obvious difference between the thing that's the most important and the other side dishes. So here, we look at the recipe name, and that's uh, 24 points versus the other stuff, which is uh, 12. Or if it was uh, you know, 32 and 16, or whatever combination you wanted to have. That means there's a big enough difference that we can actually perceive that there's a size difference, and then it, that implies a hierarchical difference. And that's going to convey that this is, you know, spaghetti bolognese, we see it right away. And I'm going to Bologna in October, so I, I love spaghetti bolognese. So we're going to use the ratio and proportion to communicate your hierarchy. You can try different proportions and see what you like, what you find works but there should be a big enough difference that it's obvious. Otherwise, we're just left wondering why, why are they different. And remember that larger items, we perceive, we interpret them as users to be more important than smaller ones. And again, make the size difference big enough to be noticeable. Okay, some methods. I like that steam. 
<laughs> white space. So I, you may have heard the term before. It refers to the space that's not filled with stuff, with objects. So you can't have an object exist in space without the space around it. And the reason white space is important is because it allows us to actually understand what that object is better. If everything is crunched together, it's visually very difficult to pick out what is the, what is the thing, what is the important, and, and how important is it. So I'm going to suggest in terms of margins and uh, space between objects, between columns, that your minimum white space is going to be whatever your minor grid step is, but two of those. So in our example, we said our, our minor grid step was 10 points. So we had a 60 was our major grid step. We had six divisions for 10 points. We're going to use 20 points. And that's what I used in this actual um, demo. So when we have everything crunched and there's no space, it's like a messy kitchen. It's really hard to get around and to understand what, what you're going to do and to do things in, a, in an orderly fashion because we're just busy like looking through everything and seeing what we need. But when it's orderly and we have space for everything, it's much easier to understand, right? So here I use 20 points. You can see across the top, the sides. It's a little bit wider on the bottom, uh, but pretty much everywhere it's, it's 10 points, as 20 points, I'm sorry, as evenly as possible. Again, just a rule of thumb. Start there, see what you like. Different screen sizes you might need to adjust. But uh, give it a try. White space is super, super, super important. It's one of the things that I think uh, I see maybe as a weakness most often is not enough uh, white space. And that compromises the, our, the user's ability to really interpret the layout. We, need, we really do need that space around. Oh, I'm sorry. So that's just uh, what the layout looks like in layout mode and the uh, boxes are showing you. So this is a little trick. You can create your 20 point boxes and put them there for you and you can anchor to them. Make them a different color. You can see there's hide object when on there so that when I'm in browse mode they don't show up. You don't have to keep them there forever. You can delete them after you're done or drag them off to the side. You just need one really and then you can just copy it and move it to where you want. Uh, Jan uh, yesterday suggested you know, using a button bar with segments of a certain uh, size that you can use to, uh, to drag your guides to. That's another uh, neat trick. So use these to help you. You don't have to eyeball it, right? And we have the uh, snap to guides, which works quite well, as long as we know what we're snapping to. So that's a little uh, trick you can use to kind of help you arrange your, um, your white space evenly, make sure that it's, it's the same width everywhere. So when everything is crowded together and kind of thrown in the layout, it's difficult to read, it's difficult to understand. And remember before I talked about that sense of safety, you know, and the sense of, oh, it just looks right? White space will give you that. It'll build trust with your users. They'll feel like, oh, yes, they know what's important, and I, now I know what's important. And because that's when we have a large text with stuff around it, we know that's the most important thing. We focus in on it. So position, sorry about that. So position is the, the coordinate system. I'm sure we're all familiar with coordinates, just simple x, y. But it's really a useful thing. It allows us to measure what, we're, uh, what the objects are on our layout. And when we measure it, we don't have to guess, are these the same width? Are they in the same place? Uh, are you familiar with the term pixel shift? You know, when you'd go from layout to layout and then you have something that's supposed to be fixed like a navigation and it just, it just moves like a little bit, right? And our visual uh, system is really, really attuned to movement, right? We can see the slightest little movement. I could be standing here completely motionless, but if I go like this, you know, I'll see that I'm waving my hand, right, very easily. So the, even a little blink, like that cursor, you think about the size of the cursor on the screen, it's really, really small. But because it's blinking, we can hone in on it. So pixel shift works the same way when uh, we go from um, layout to layout and something that's fixed just jumps by one or two pixels. You'll see that. But if you use the position uh, palette, 
you can actually go to your layout and check. And I do this all the time. I keep a pad uh, by my mouse, and I just write down the coordinates of things, and I go through and check, are they all in the same spot? So this one is uh, 20 points. I showed you this uh, already. And uh, you, so you can see that uh, position left, top, left, right, top, bottom. Those are really, really handy uh, coordinates, and you can change the size by just typing right in there. Um, I've been working in Keynote a lot, and actually Keynote doesn't give you this much information. You can't, it just gives you one, and then I can't remember exactly how it's done, but it's not as much information as FileMaker is giving us, and it's not as easy to manipulate the sizes. So this is really, really handy. I use it all the time. So when you use that position palette, and I don't know if everybody knows this, but you can bring up more than one inspector palette uh, inside FileMaker. And so you can have one on position if you're using it a lot, and then bring up another one and show something else. And that's really handy when you're working because you don't have to constantly keep switching between different palettes. If you have a small screen, it's a little harder because then you, know, you run out of space. But it's, uh, it's a really great little trick to be able to, be able to move, move things and actually do other stuff at the same time, check themes or whatever styles. And you can move the objects really precisely using that little palette. So resizing objects. So this, if you have a number of um, a, a button bar, and it's a total, so it has some length. If you have three, uh, if you divide it by the number of segments, you'll get the size of the segment. And why am I telling you this? Because the button bar does not like other objects. When I was expecting that when you add a segment, it, it will increase the button bar by the size of the segment. Does anybody else feel that they? felt that it was gonna, how it was gonna be. But what happens is that it actually, it keeps the total length the same, and you now get four segments that are smaller than what you had before. But I actually want my segments to be all that size because I need that white space around the edge of the button. Uh, that's, what I, that's what I like, that's what I wanna keep. But it, you, what you realize is there's a little tool tip that comes up when you drag the handle of the button bar. And you actually, you can't just click on it. You actually have to drag it a little bit, which is a bit of a pain. But if you're careful, you can see, all right, that segment is 127 points. But you can also just take the total length from the position and just divide it by the number of segments you have. And then you write down how many it is. And you add it to the total. And then your button bar will expand. So this is what happens when you add it. It just kind of crunches in. You can see. You can't see that button, the text on it at all. But if I add it on, ta-da, you've got now four equally sized buttons. So it's just a way to use the math to, so that you're not just dragging and eyeballing, because maybe you have 10 other layouts that have that same button bar with segments of that size, and you don't want to make them all look different, right? You want them to, keep, to preserve that size. So just a little trick to, to, to do that. So the resizing and the position work together so that you can manipulate the objects more easily, so that you can be more consistent from layout to layout, and we're going to support the user by being consistent and help them to learn your app and think that you're a great designer and help you with your development because you're taking the guesswork out of you know, how, how big should it be. It's a simple calculation. OK, some uh, presentation methods. Take the steam on my turkey. It's going to just side to side. So I'm not sure if everybody knows what, uh, what letting is. Um, but it comes, it's a term that comes for the days where actually people would set type. So actual metal type in you know, typing. Uh, they would uh, typeset newspapers and books and other publicated material or published material, sorry. And the point size actually does have a, a correlation to inches, and this is what they were using at the time. So one point is actually 172nd of an inch. And the leading was actually the amount of space. It was just a piece. It was called leading because it was just a blank piece of lead that would be below the letters, and it would separate the lines from one another. And in the electronic era, we can actually play with that leading. It may be called line space now. The leading is the technical term, I guess. And uh, what I find, one of my little pet peeves, it's not a big thing, but it is a noticeable thing to me and I think subconsciously to the users, 
is that the default line spacing is quite tight. So if you just put a text box and you choose a font size and you throw it on the layout, FileMaker doesn't give you a lot of letting. It gives you a, a little bit, but not that much. And I've noticed something really interesting, and I haven't checked this in other versions of FileMaker, but if you go to the palette and you, you select a, a field and you go to the palette and you look at the uh, line spacing and it says one point, you'll get this. But if you switch it, sorry, if it says one line, if you switch it to points, the, 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 um, um, the units, to points, it actually gives you 16 and it changes and it makes it bigger. So that was kind of an odd behavior, which I hadn't seen before, because I was going to tell you, you know, use 16 <laughs> instead of one. So all you need to do really is change the units on it. So th this is what you get by default. And it doesn't look bad, but to me, it, it feels like very, especially with large amounts of text. The portal's pretty good because the portal has lines dividing it, so there's already a little extra space built in when you add uh, fields to a portal. But the uh, fields, when you put them on top of each other, especially when you make a group, like there's lots of space. Like we want more white space, but everything's kind of crunched together, right? So I'm gonna show you, I don't know, you'll, you'll have to look carefully to see the shift. There it is. It was very, very subtle. Right, but uh, do you want me to do it again? Back, and just a little bit more. It's a small detail, but I think it can add a lot. You don't use up a ton of space doing this, but you just enhance the readability. Just makes it that much easier. Anything you can do to hold the user's hand along the way will help you. That's because people have limited brain power. Right, everyone's brain power is limited. We're looking at, there's an awful lot of stimulation. I think I, I heard recently that we absorb five times the information today that we did even 10 years ago, right? Coming at us from all different advertising, you know, uh, articles on the web, social media. We're absorbing, absorbing, absorbing all the time. So that means that even just the average person is kind of, you know, like they're, they're, they're tired, they have short attention spans. And if they're using a, uh, an, app, an app that you've created, often it's for their work. Uh, they're trying to get something accomplished. They're trying to get something done. So even these little things that help them, that uh, enable them to understand more easily, uh, to, to process and to reduce the amount of work and decision making that they're uh, asked to do will help you. Because you know what? In your app, at some point, they're going to get a critical decision. Yes, no. Do you want to delete this record? You want them to have the brain power to make the right decision at that point and not have worn it down by the time they get there by the, all these little like death by a thousand cuts, right? So what I tend to do is uh, I tend to put it either 1.1, 1.2 if it's a block of text or just increase the uh, field borders by a little bit and then use that one as your template to, uh, or you can select your field and just change all of the sizes. I love the new, um, the, 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 uh, the automatic um, locking of objects because it makes it a way easier to make sure that things are aligned. So be generous with, with the line height and the letting, or otherwise known as letting. Okay, so Fitz Law. So Fitz was a psychologist and this is, you know, the description of his law, but you don't really need to know this. Uh, there's, it's a whole lot of, of stuff. I'm not going to test you on this actual math. And in fact, you'd need to do some testing and figure out what the average times would be anyway, so we're not going to do all that. But the concept is really sound. And essentially says, it boils down to, in a practical sense, that buttons that are larger and are closer to where the uh, user already is, let's say their mouse, is easier to hit than something that is smaller and or farther away. So it takes more time. Uh, so the, the law says that the more distance you have to travel, the harder it is to be accurate with actually hitting a target. So it applies on uh, both desktop and mobile. In mobile, uh, you have a finger which is actually larger then uh, you can be a lot less accurate with your finger than you can with a mouse pointer. So you have to be even a little bit more conscious of this on mobile and allowing the, the targets uh, to be easy to hit.
But even on desktop, uh, what we want to do is something especially that we're using all the time, we want to make it easier. Just like if we sit down to dinner, we have our knife and our fork really close at hand, right? We, uh, we, we could put them in, you know, when we go camping, we have a little uh, jug and we just put all the knives and forks in the middle. And that works, but it takes more time, right, to pull them out and, and bring them over to where you're going to use them. And as we just talked about, we want to make it easier. We want to reduce that friction. So something that's being used all the time, you can put it right up front at top and make it fairly wide and generous, easy to hit. There's a popover on the bottom, in the bottom left corner, there's a little um, uh, camera and a, and, a, and a link. Those are popovers too, but when I designed the system, I thought, well, we don't really need to see the, the, the uh, photo of this all that often. It'll probably just be there when we print it out. But browsing recipes, that's going to happen all the time. So we want that to be close. This also, if we're doing things in context, sometimes rather than making the, tr the user travel all the way to the top right or left, we're going to provide them a button in context where, so it's close to where they actually will be making their decision. Maybe it's like an edit button. That edit button isn't going to be you know, somewhere disconnected from what they're editing. You want it to be close to what they're editing. That will make it easier for them to hit and, more, and uh, use it more accurately. So uh, whenever you can, try providing the buttons taking action in context. And buttons are so important because in FileMaker, it's not just often about presenting data. It's about actually getting information back from the user and allowing them to take action in some way. Uh, so so maybe partly it could be getting information from them so you're presenting them with a button so that they can actually put something in or you're asking them to actually do something or providing them, providing them with a feature, maybe it's a print button or a create project or whatever that is. So Hick, it was also a psychologist of around the same era, first half of the 20th century. And he had also a very obscure mathematical formula that applies to interface design. Uh, you don't need to also know this formula, um, but it talks about how long does it take someone to make a choice out of a list of choices. And sometimes we have quite a lot of choices available to us. And what Hicks Law tells us is that the time the required to make that decision increases logarithmically as the number of choices increase. So that means if there's two decisions, it might take half, you know, a certain amount of time. But if there's 10 decisions, it might take logarithmically, a it's a geometric it doesn't just take 10 times as long, it takes much longer. Of course, we're talking about microseconds, but if somebody has a really long list of stuff, that can add up. Like, let's say you go to Amazon and you're presented with an alphabetical list of every book that Amazon has. So they've done that by giving us you know, a search button so we can zero in, and we still might have to look through a list of stuff, right? What we can do to help, what Amazon in fact does, and what a lot of us as um, designers should be doing, is providing categories, like a menu. Can you imagine if you went to the, uh, to, to the restaurant and they just give you an alphabetical list of every dish they had and expected you to order like that? You know, you'd be like, okay, I want um, apple pie, because that's at the top of the list. So we're going we're gonna to use categories. So alphabetical is actually a valid uh, way of categorizing, but probably you're going to have some natural groupings within your data. So within the food, we've got main dishes, starters, sides, desserts. Whatever field you happen to be in, there's probably some groupings, some categories that you can find. And I find it challenging sometimes as a designer to just come up with those categories on my own. A lot of times you need to actually go to the uh, user base and ask them to suggest some categories. And if you can avoid it, try and uh, stay away from things like type, category, kind, because those don't really mean anything. Uh, may, maybe, uh, they, maybe they do in the context, but if you can make it like 
we see main dishes, right? We actually know what that's describing. It's not just like type. We actually, if we, if we saw something like that said type, we'd actually have to look at the data to understand what that referred to. Sometimes that you, you can't avoid it, but if you have a language, if there is already some um, pre-existing jargon even that, that maps onto your data that allows you to help the user categorize it, that's great because they already know what those categories mean and it means that they can kind of zone in on those. Uh, in here, we have a meal type season date added. We already have the buttons at the top that are um, chunked for us. We have different functions, new recipe, find recipe, browse recipes, shopping list. That's a form of, of chunking and categorizing that's allowing the user to make a decision. And I would limit, I, you can't just give, put 20 of those across the top because now you're back to the original problem again. So now if you have a really large number of, of options, you gotta say, okay, well now I need another level above it of, of categorization so that I can reduce it down to a manageable number. It's better to have layers than to have uh, one set you know, of, of a few items each. It's better to have three levels down rather than trying to make them choose from a very long list. Five to seven is probably the max. So we want to organize and group the data logically, essentially so that we can preserve the user's mental resources like we talked about before, so that when we need to ask them for a big decision, they, they can do it. And it's also just, it's just, it's just nice. You know, it just makes it nicer to use. You don't have to go through an arduous process of finding what you need. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. We talked about some elements of design. We talked about some basic techniques that you can use to, to uh, apply to your designs. Some methods, some methods of presentation. I really hope that you will take these away. Uh, you will use them in your future designs. And I hope that you can see that really design is based in a very grounded way. And we sometimes it, we become mystified a little bit by it, but we can take a step back and look at the actual underpinnings and the foundations of these. And you can even go and look at uh, some of your existing stuff and say, okay, how can I apply this? Maybe I need more white space. You know, maybe I should uh, use a grid. You know, I hope you're inspired to take these away and use them. Thank you very much. If there's any questions, uh, please come up to the mic. I'm here for, uh, for a little while. And also, a couple of announcements um, as well. The evaluations, I believe FileMaker changed to a different method of filling out the evaluations this year, and there was some kind of issue in the last couple of days with collecting the evaluations. So they've asked me to um, mention it to you and ask if you might consider redoing the evaluations uh, from yesterday and perhaps possibly Monday. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing also is that Albert uh, had asked me, oh, and he's coming up to the mic now, he'd asked me to mention that uh, he has a design, he's running a design smackdown in the far corner at the breaks and at lunch, correct? That's right, that's right, and tomorrow at two. Okay, and today and tomorrow. So please uh, go, go there. Albert is very, very knowledgeable. He'll help you uh, and he'll actually look at your solutions, which is great. So you'll get some really practical, uh, customized advice for you. And Al Albert, I took his master class in Miami a few years ago. It was excellent. So if you have the opportunity to take that, please do. And uh, if you have any questions for me while I'm walking around, uh, just, just let me know. So Albert, you have a question? Thanks, Alexis. I want to point out something about Fitt's law because when Bruce Todd Mazzini talks about that, he says that you know the upper edge of a screen when you're using a mouse is basically infinitely large because you can throw your mouse up there, trackpad, and you can reach that target of the menu bar. And then you know you might think that when you're designing for mobile, you no longer have that. And it's really not true because swiping, swipe left or right or scrolling is also infinitely large. So in your progression of saying, how big is your target? You know, how close is your target? Scrolling and swiping are infinitely close because wherever your fingers are, you can get at it and infinitely large. 
And so it's kind of a reversal of what we were saying in the past to try to put everything on the same layout. You can put it out of sight and it's infinitely easy to get to the motion of scrolling and swiping. And all you have to do is look at someone scrubbing through their Facebook feed to know that we really know how to scroll these days. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that in the last few years, we've received some new gestures and new abilities that we may not have had before that change our uh, interactions a little bit. I've tried to keep this simple and straightforward for people who are just new to design, but Albert makes a good point in sophisticated interfaces. We do, some of the, the, the um, rules change a little bit. On mobile, really it's the edges, right, like that happen, and also the size. I find uh, certain applications like Twitter, that those buttons are really small. Like I try, to, I try to click into something and I end up replying or I end up liking something that I didn't mean to, and it's happening to me all the time. Um, but yeah, the, the outer edges end up, I think what you were saying is that when you, when you scroll up with your mouse, it kind of hits the top and stops there. So it's almost like uh, you know, throwing a ball against the wall and you catch it. So it, it provides you with muscle memory um, to be able to hit those, those edges and in, on mobile as well. I still think that it applies in that you know, even if you're scrolling through your feed, you still need the buttons that are related to replying and whatever it is, liking, uh, favoriting, whatever, to be close to the thing that actually it applies to, right? So it's partly about that as well. Uh, is there another question? Yes. I would be interested in your thoughts with regard to button bar sizing relative to specifically button bars that have hide conditions on certain buttons. Because as you illustrated, when you change the number of buttons, it doesn't change the size of the bar, but it resizes those buttons. So if you have a button bar, for example, that may have seven or eight buttons possible, but due to permissions, the user may see two or eight. How would you suggest approaching that? Well, I think you have to, d to design so that you leave, especially if you're wanting an integrated interface for everyone. So you're doing one layout and you're hiding or showing things conditionally based on people's permissions. Then you have to uh, design for the most number that mm -hmm. you po could, could possibly have. Because we don't mind seeing a little bit of blank space, you know, if there's only two buttons, that's okay. Uh, is that, is that, does that answer your question? Well, sort of, um, because I'm a real big fan of alignment, and I've been to Albert's class, <laughs> so that helps. But I, I like things being aligned, and if I have, for example, a top navigation, system-wide navigation to different modules, for example, I like things to be aligned in the rest of the UI with that. I think that's easier. It's, oh, things okay. don't look jagged, but you have less ability to maintain that if not all of those modules are always going to be available. So do you use the object anchoring? Yes. Okay. But the size, the width of the individual buttons will change based on how many of them are accessible. Right. If you anchor it to the right-hand side, Right. Well, it'll just stretch it, though. It won't maintain oh, a fixed. Oh, I see. I see what you're saying. It won't maintain a fixed width. So in that case, maybe you you use hide object when, and then you show your. I mean, I know it's a little hard, right? Because you have um, you're trying to do a, a universal navigation. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, I think I have like a slight idea. I think one time I tried to actually just use blank buttons in the button bar. That when you're hiding one, you show another one, but it's empty and it doesn't do anything and that fills the space back. I see, okay, so that's a good suggestion. Um, it's still a little tricky. I think it's not quite what she was hoping for. She's just saying maintain the size the same no matter how many buttons are shown. Yeah, maybe, maybe feature request for FileMaker, perhaps? But I do have a question. What, uh, what's your advice on dealing, I mean, we've dealt with a lot of stuff that's sort of landscape, but dealing with iPads, iPhones that are portrait, and you know, using golden rectangles in there, I mean, obviously, we don't want to have like menu bars that take up the, the top section exactly. Do you, I mean, like section it off into one golden rectangle based on on the overall width and use that as a guide, or just do yeah? I mean, it? your your screens aren't going to always provide you with an opportunity to do a golden rectangle. And maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, I wouldn't be. I wouldn't try to be too didactic about using a golden rectangle, get as close as you can. Uh, we're not going to know that, we're going to go, that's not a golden rectangle, that person doesn't know what they're doing. 
you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to accommodate it. So I would just say if you're interested in using it and it's not quite, I would just get, get close or use the rule of thirds. As long as you're using something, I think really, and you're applying that something consistently across layout to layout. Uh, and I like the golden rectangle because it gives a nice, uh, a nice feeling of, of a nice meaty, you know, uh, slice. Uh, but you can use the rule of thirds as a little, a little uh, thinner, but still works, still in the zone. You compromise. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, well, use these rules, but don't use them and just compromise on everything. But it's kind of what I'm saying. Use them as, as a, um, a starting point. Experiment. Try. You know, see. see do a different, couple different ways and see if you like it. Another question? Yes, there's a lot of concentration and talk about developing interfaces for mobile, but we've also seen the increases in options in the other direction with uh, ultra high resolution displays. I use one that's 3840 by 2400. And I'm just curious, uh, any recommendations on how do you manage that? I mean, do you, I'm certainly not gonna make my interface require that. So do I say, oh, make it go to the top left always? Uh, that's to some extent a, a matter of taste. I'm not a, a fan of super big screens. I know a lot of designers are. Uh, I find them just a bit overwhelming. Like I, I've been the last year or so thought I, I probably have ADD, <laughs> you know, because I just get distracted by so much. And if I have a really large screen, it just kind of I feel like there's all this empty space there, and I want to fill it. But then if I fill it, I get distracted. I would say really choose a size, whatever that size is. There's the stencils in FileMaker in the layout mode that will give you the orange you know, um, uh, borders, the guys to tell you what's screen size. Choose something and figure out where you want it to see. I kind of like things in the middle. I, I don't like them off to the left because I find them too asymmetrical. I kind of like to have them somewhere in the middle, maybe at the top. Um, that's just me. Maybe ask also, you know, your, the preference of the, who you're designing for, what they would prefer. I've done in WebDirect, I tend to anchor to the middle too, because you have that problem as well, right, where people have all differing screen sizes when they come in. And I find that it looks weird where, where you pull it and everything just stays. It's like, I, that didn't do anything, but I want my screen to be this big. And, you know, so I, I like it when it's anchored, centered, and, um, you know, it, it, it ends, like not necessarily just infinitely, you know, it has like a little, it has a box around it. So it feels symmetrical, but you're still um, making some borders. Are there any other questions? I have a, I have a question. This may be a question with no solution I've been asking around, but if you have a layout, if you have an application with lots of layouts, like maybe 100 layouts, and you expand into another department, you find you have to physically add a button to your button bar. Is there any other solution but to go through every one of those layouts and change every button bar manually, or can you reference a button bar into every layout? Is there some solution to that? No, you can't. I think you can leave uh, some blank and then uh, add them you know, later, like so, so provision them like for future use. But no, there's no real workaround to actually physically putting those buttons there, unfortunately. I mean, is that, am I the only one that's having that problem? Because it just seems No, like I think it is a problem, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's a limitation of the way FileMaker works yeah. at the moment. Okay. Yeah, we, we don't have quite that level of abstraction. Okay. Maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Do you have any advice for cross-platform fonts? So the question is, uh, do I have any advice about cross-platform fonts? And I'm going to say you weren't in my session yesterday. <laughs> um, so there is, if you look at the slides, you'll see there are a very uh, small number of fonts that are pretty much guaranteed to work cross-platform. Uh, there's Arial, um, Tahoma, Verdana, and uh, Trebuchet that are installed on pretty much 99% of both Windows and Mac. Uh, no, they do not render quite exactly the same. Typically, they tend to render a little wider on PC. So what I do often is I leave generous, if I know it's going to be on PC, I leave generous labels because the number one complaint is the text is cut off. I can't see it. So uh, it has to do with how much space you've left for the, for the field, for the text to appear inside of the field label. So just, I always drag them. And you never get enough. If you create the text and you put it on the layout, 
and you start typing, it, FileMaker just gives you the, like, the end. So you always have to end up dragging it out. So I would say um, go for your widest, whatever your widest, like leave enough so that, uh, if, especially if you're using a wide font as well, like Verdana is significantly wider than some of the other ones. It's more readable uh, at the screen, and especially at small sizes, but um, it's significantly wider than everything else. So if you're, especially if you're designing on Mac and you know it's gonna be Windows later, be generous with uh, what you have. That said, uh, I, I mentioned yesterday also that a lot of people have Word installed, so you may be able to uh, do some fonts for that, that are in Word already, um, uh, you, you can utilize those, but it's a bit hit or miss uh, in terms of specifying fonts that are outside of that very short list. And it's a problem all over the web pretty much, but I'm hoping that um, at some point we'll be able to increase and, and maybe have web fonts available to us. I don't know what the solution is, but it would be really, really nice uh, to be able to expand that list. Okay, if there are no other questions, then thank you very much for uh, your time today. Anna.